Hello and welcome to Matt and Mike Pole Focus. I'm Mike. And I'm not. And today is going to be a bit of a weird one, isn't it, Matt, since uh, we've already recorded our interview with our, uh, our special guest. Yeah, this is our first pre-recorded interview tape that we've, uh, that we've ever done. Yeah, unfortunately, I had a bit of uh, unfortunate family news. So um, thankfully, Matt stepped in and spoke to our special guest, who is Tulson Tollett, uh, former professional rugby player and now a sports presenter who's worked for Channel 4, BBC Radio and Sky Sports. Uh, Listen to the interview before we, we actually recorded this. And yeah, sounds like a lovely guy. He's great, man. Like, yeah, I met him uh, about uh, three or four years ago, and uh, he's just been wonderfully helpful, you know, really, really um, sort of informative, you know, about media in general and his career and everything. And, and he's just one of these people that just, you know, gives you hope that, you know, it, that it's not just dickheads who work, you know, in that <laughs> high up in the uh, in these in these industries. You know, there's there's uh, real human beings there who are lovely and very sort of accessible and willing to talk to you about the processes and stuff like that. So he's, he's yeah, he's just been great, a great guy to know. And he, he uh, agreed to come on the uh, podcast to talk about one of his favorite favorite films which is the count of monte cristo yeah um and, and it was a real curveball because he sort of said to me he said well you know i i, I could talk about the dark knight trilogy because i love those movies and christopher nolan movies in general and then at the very last so we kind of agreed on that and then at the last minute he went do you want do you want to talk about something a bit more unconventional and i was like go on then <laughs> and i had no idea what to expect and, he, and uh, i hadn't seen this film uh, yeah, so uh, it was it was i liked i was appreciative of that because as great as it would have been to talk about uh, the dark knight you know uh, it's been I think it's been talked about enough by other people shall we say <laughs> but uh, The Count of Monte Cristo was um, yeah it's a fantastic um, uh, Guy Pearce and Jim Caviezel 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 yeah. vehicle Caviezel yeah. the guy the Jesus basically the man who played Jesus in Passion of the Christ yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, presumably friend of Mel Gibson so uh, yeah do with that what you will he hasn't done much but, since uh, has he <laughs> unfortunately but, uh, but I, I was happy as well when I saw that Guy Pearce was cast because I know obviously you're a big Guy Pearce fan Mike that's fair to say. Big Guy Pearce fan, yes. Uh, ever since, I mean, you mentioned it in the in the interview, but ever since you starred in uh, Memento, I just think the the world of the guy and just want him to be in everything and everything, apart from when he's playing a 95-year-old man in Prometheus when he was maybe dreadfully miscast or <laughs> yeah, yeah, putting the wrong yeah. kind of I makeup. Mean, get a real, Christopher Plummer was still alive at that point. You know, maybe he would have done a better job yeah. uh, you know, as, a, as a real 80, 19-year-old man. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, I have to say, I prefer his performance a lot more in Alien Covenant because he didn't have the makeup on and he was just being awesome guy Pierce and he was only in so it for two minutes was, uh, as well I'm sure you like that as well yeah yeah that's that's enough yeah yeah exactly but yeah I mean Prometheus we don't even you we, know, yeah we, we don't need, need to, to talk do about a, that a, <laughs> no because that's gonna that's gonna cause some uh, some violence it's all about positivity <laughs> all about positivity yeah, here, Matt. yeah. let's keep it positive today. exactly but like you said it, it's weird that um, we had someone come in who was able to introduce a film to both of us because it's either I'm introducing a film to you or or vice versa, or you know, yeah. one of us is familiar with the film when uh, our guest has has recommended it. But this one was just like, oh, okay, both Matt and me have to watch it for the first time, and we get to like encounter it for the first time and learn why they like it. And yeah, I thought it was a great. And film. He, he was really surprised as well. He was kind of like, I, I was, you know, you guys don't know this movie, and it was kind of like, you know, <laughs> it was one. It, it, it's such a having watched it now, it, it's one of these movies that you feel like you've seen before. Yeah, uh, and it feels, um, should we say, a little. Um, what's the word cliche some of the moments but the reason it's cliche is because it was the original source material yeah. for so many um, kind of copycat uh, you know epics and stories since like there was elements of the great Gatsby in there um, you know just all sorts of like period drama kind of staples you know and things like that you know that we kind of take for granted now but you know this the the, the, twi- the twists and turns in the story must have been kind of mind-blowing really for the time and I can yeah. see why it's became such a popular book because uh yeah I mean I think I think that the the, the closer the um as I said the, the the thing that it reminded me most of uh, in some of its main plot points was the great Gatsby and uh and that that is the uh, Baz Luhrmann adaptation of that is is uh, one of my, probably one of my favorite films at this point I really love that so so yeah it was fantastic yeah I I agree it's very much a quintessential um, story of revenge and trying to get back at the people who wronged you um, like it, all the tropes of think people thinking you're dead coming back in a disguise as someone else having reinvented your character and just slowly picking yeah. apart someone else's life is 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 beautiful I find I think it is quite a quintessential revenge film and revenge story just 
uh, overall. There's so many tropes that have been used in so many other different films. Um, the idea of them thinking that he was uh, he, Dantes was dead and he comes back reinvented as a different person and just slowly picks apart um, his enemies' lives and tries to take them down, like using the finances, using you know. Strangely enough, I see parts of it in. Um, the Dark Knight Rises with uh, oh yeah yeah with like um, Miranda Tate uh, taking down um, Bruce Wayne and his fortune and, and like coming back as someone that you didn't think was uh, the actual you yeah, know yeah, um, exactly Talia Al Ghul um, but also Old Boy one of my favourites uh, but um, strangely enough from the ah yes like for, from the villain's point of view he is the Dantes he's he's come back into someone who's ruined his life and like decides to take him down ironically imprison him for a, a large portion of time and like he tries to like break yeah. out through the bricks and you know very similar situation um but only to then discover that like oh no i am the person i'm not getting my revenge it's the villain who's getting the revenge and yeah but it, I- that was actually like one of my favorite sections in the movie was the richard harris um you know scenes in the in the prison yeah me too uh, and again that had elements of shawshank in it mm-hmm. you know it was like you know again it, it just it felt it read as kind of like a you know, a, a sort of just a catalogue of like amazing movies, but they were all in the same plot. So I was kind of like, you know, it felt like a lot of other movies have a lot to answer for, really. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know? they reference um, this in Shawshank, don't they? It's one of the books in the library that um, that Tim Robbins reads. Is it? I, I remember it. I, I, it reminds me of V for Vendetta because you know the V character. Oh, he watches it. Yeah, his, in the film. His, yeah, it's like his hero, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, but that, that's the scene in in modern movies that reminds me of it. Yeah. Very uh, similar. But I hadn't remembered that that in Shawshank. Was it? Was it Alex? Oh, Alexander Dumas. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Course. The Dumas thing. Yes. Yeah. Dumas. Dum, scene, yeah. Dumas. Dumas. Yeah. Um, so, Dumas. So it's in, it's in Shawshank. Yeah. It's in uh, V for Vendetta. Again, just any kind of revenge based um, film of our time is usually kind of linked back to Monte Cristo. Or God, that's such a that's such a, a kind of giveaway, isn't it? Now, when you think about it, you know the sort of tunneling out of the prison scene. That's that is such a sly, like you know, nod to like uh, what's going to happen later if you think about it. Yeah, and not even that, but like <laughs> weirdly enough, when when um, Dantes is in the. A prison and he's he switches out Richard Harris's body for his own. I yeah. was like, oh, Silence of the Lambs. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh God, Lo- yeah. Loads of different references where like someone's pretended to be the dead body and getting carried out and getting the escape. And I was like, oh, it came from there. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah. What a great trope. Wow. Dumbass is, uh, is is nay dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well said. Um, but Thank you. yeah, the, the the section in the prison I thought was really interesting, just because it really took its time to grow the character. You really felt those thirteen years. It didn't just like brush it over. Like you, you meet you meet him. Well, he's he's slowly going insane. He spent so many years alone, and then Richard Harris is able to to be there and be the the tutor. And when he's not there to deliver the plate out i was actually pretty nervous i was like oh how are they going to do this no and i was like i can't believe it's gripped me this much this montage of them being in prison together <laughs> yeah. um yeah i really felt for them yeah it was real edge of the seat stuff and i want to say thank you again to tulson for recommending it to us and uh for giving us the interview as well so uh shall we have a listen in uh if you want to have a little listen to this interview now yeah fantastic idea cool let's roll it play the roller tape Tolson, thank you very much for uh, doing this, mate. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I just, uh, I just wanted to ask you a little bit before we get uh, talk, talking about your movie of choice. Uh, can we just ask you a little bit about your life and career thus far, and what you've, uh, what your journey's been up to this point? Yeah, it's been an interesting journey. I, I was born in, in Hastings in East Sussex, um, emigrated to Australia when I was six years of age. Uh, all my schooling and university was done over there and I began playing sport um, at a decent level when I was sort of 14 or 15 and it translated into a semi-professional and then professional level as I went through over the next sort of few years. Um, So as I was at university, I was still uh, playing um, professionally as well. So I was mixing the two. I was given the opportunity to come and play in London and my, my initial plan was only to come over and, and, and play rugby league this is to come over and play for a year and then maybe two and then and then go back. But I enjoyed it so much that I ended up staying and playing for about seven or eight. So it was a busy time. Um, and, and when I was actually playing, I, I got into doing commentary and learning how reporting went and how presenting. Just I basically turned up to studios and sit there and 
because of the fact I was playing sport, I was able to have the contacts that I could go in and sit in and learn how to do these things. And um, I, I spent a bit of time at Radio 5 Live with a guy called Mark Pugach, who's now quite well known, who does BT Sport and, and ITV as well. So I, I spent time with Mark sitting in the studio, learning how the very simple things were done and learning how to go to crosses and learning how uh, segues were done and et cetera. And I was given an opportunity by Five Live to do some co-commentary and then Radio Five Live Sports Extra started up, which is their digital channel, and they needed someone to present rugby league. And it was a bit of a – when that station first started, it was there weren't that many listeners. And it, was, it was a good training ground for me because I was given the opportunity to learn uh, as I was doing the job. So – I went from there and then um, from there I was working at Sky Sports as well as a, as a pundit slash co-presenter and from there we spent um, two years, my wife and I, we went to Australia and we spent two years living over there and I was working for the ABC uh, as a presenter on their uh, equivalent of the uh, the BBC News Channel which was ABC News 24 as it was at the time and I became their breakfast uh, sports presenter on the weekend for television. I was working on um, a radio station called ABC News Radio is the breakfast presenter on that. Um, and then when we moved back to this side of the world, to the Northern Hemisphere, I started working again for the BBC and I've been working there uh, ever since and, and mixing it in with a bit of teaching. So um, as a presenter and, and commentator, and I've worked on the, the recent um, Paralympics just gone, and I'm going to Beijing for the Winter Olympics as well. So there's a nice mixture of different sports that I do away from just the rugby side of things. So there's probably too many things to go into right now, but but basically, but basically my my career in a synopsis has been play sport, go into commentary and TV presenting as well as some radio as well, and do teaching to go with it uh, along along the way as well as trying to mix all that in um, with my family. So it's been a, a bit of a journey. Um, it's still yeah. ongoing. I don't know where it's going to end up. I still don't know what I want to do with my life, and I'm 48 years of age. So um, I think that's the the way to look at it is that you appreciate what you're doing. Um, and try and better yourself all the time and just really work hard at what you do and, and see where things take you from there. It's a fascinating career, like journey. I mean, the question is, what, what are you going to do next? Is this, you know, you're going to be an astronaut or like, you know, what's, <laughs> what, what's left to do? But um, I suppose like what I'm interested in uh, with you is like, it, it, to me, it seems like quite a leap from being, uh, you know, a professional rugby player to getting into broadcasting and hosting because um, I, I guess a lot of people on television like you know uh, news hosts and so on probably have that kind of maybe actor film and tv experience or something that they you know maybe they were drama students when they were younger and they kind of wanted to be in front of the camera um, and was that something that ever occurred to you or did you literally just kind of fall into it? Do you know what? I didn't actually, there was no plan for me to, to actually go into doing anything and, and, and in the last couple of years of my playing career I I used to do um, a fair few interviews when um, the, the broadcasters would come around. They'd always be looking for someone to do stuff, and a lot of guys weren't that interested in doing it. And I quite, I, I quite enjoyed the idea of, of you know talking about things that we've done and and trying to sort of put that point of view across. And just from there, I I managed to um, just become in, engrossed in how things worked, and not just in front of the camera but behind the camera as well, and just see how. The whole operation worked and I just spent numerous times as I said going into the studios and just learning how things were done and I was quite happy to do it for free because the only way that you'll get anywhere I believe when it comes to doing things in this industry is you don't just walk into it like you can't just you can't do a degree in um in broadcasting or journalism uh, whatever it may be and just go do you know what I'm going to walk into doing this job it doesn't work that way it's not a career where you have a piece of paper and you go right I can do this now because you can do all the theory stuff that you want, but unless you're actually being put out there, unless you're in a position where things go wrong and you have to learn how to think on the move and on the run, then you just, you won't make it. And you've got to have a bit, there's a, there's, in this industry, you have to be a very thick skinned. You have to accept rejection. Um, you have to learn with this disappointment. It builds character um, as far as I'm concerned. And you know, numerous times I've been rejected for things. And I've been told that, no, I'm not good enough for that. And, I, I can't do this. And then you just keep on knocking the door and eventually the door falls down. Um, but people come from really different backgrounds. Like As I said, I, I've got a school teaching background. And for me, broadcasting is very similar to teaching because you, you're talking a lot and you're talking to different people. So for me, teaching is very similar to what broadcasting is. And there are so many broadcasters who were teachers originally. So there are people that come from all different walks of life. And it's, it's actually strange that you'd find someone who comes from a journalistic background at university if you're a bachelor of arts in journalism or broadcasting or whatever 
people don't generally come from that. They do those type of things and then they end up moving towards something else. So the industry as a whole is more of a, a sort of a complexity of different careers coming together when people are doing things. And it's all about sticking with it, as I said, and it's all about learning as you go along and just m- making sure it's a very small industry as well. People don't realise how small an industry it is. They think it's so compl- I know, so widely spread and there are people everywhere, but everyone knows everyone. So you've always got to be careful in what you say when you're talking to people and you always be polite. And I just find that's the nicest way to do things. Well, I, I kind of got that impression when you kindly gave us a tour of the BBC offices that, I mean, I know it was kind of nine o'clock at night, but it was very much a skeleton crew at that point. You know, there was about sort of, I think in the control room, I think there was about five or six people there. And like, you know, and I remember thinking you, you kind of, you, your vision of the BBC, you know, control room is it's full, it's packed, you know, everyone's at every station. But it seemed to me like there were about four or five people who were sort of, you know, steering the ship. Is that, is that quite normal? Pretty much so. Um, if I was, for example, if I if I worked on um, what I generally do, which is BBC World News, now there's 110 million people a week that watch that channel. So yeah. you, make, you have to make sure what you're doing is done well. So we'll have three people working at night time, including myself. I'll have a producer. I'll have a broadcast assistant who will do a lot of the work um, for, for graphics and insets and different types of things as well and cutting things. And then you have a gallery crew where there's only three people there. You have your sound You've got your um, your director and you've got your, your technical manager as well. So you've only got six people who are working together in the evening to produce, you know, 10 and a half minutes of, of output every hour. So I find that working in small groups, as long as you all get on with each other, is actually more beneficial than working in a group where there's too many people. So during the daytime, there might be a few more people, depending on what shows are happening. This is TV specific I'm talking about here. Radio could be a little bit different. But generally, you'll have small groups of people who are working together. There's times when we have to do certain things, which um, if, it's, if a story breaks and, and news want them want the sport to talk about it, then you need to know what you're talking about and go in front of a camera and maybe talk to them for two or three minutes about what the story is about. So you have to keep on top of things all the time. And I generally, before I go in for a shift, I generally try and use that time, whether it's walking to work or whether I'm on a bus or the metro or whatever it may be, I try and use that time to, to know what's happening before I get there because especially if something's happened during the day, you, you need to know, you need to hit the ground running and need to know exactly what you're doing when you get in there. So, you know, it, it's not the type of thing where you walk into and, People think that, oh, yeah, it's sport. It's a bit of a laugh. It's a bit of a joke. It's not really because if you don't know what you're talking about, you can be made to look really foolish. And it's happened before in the past where people have thought that they can just get there and talk about it. And it's it's not like that, especially working in sports news where, where I'm in. There's some big stories that happen and it's more bordering on the, on the news where there's a big crossover, especially at the moment with so many stories which are happening around the world. And You've got to be on top of things and have to understand the content and understand what context it's in to be able to get your point across. I suppose when you mentioned the viewing figures before as well, I mean, another question is, um, do you have any nerves left, you know, when it comes to, you know, I mean, is it uh, easier to perform to a camera knowing that there's millions watching than maybe standing in a conference room and talking to three people? I mean, do you have any nerves at all about speaking to people or...? You know, that's a really that's a really good question because, as I said, I work as a school teacher as well. I find it more nerve wracking if I'm asked to go in and be a supply teacher for a day where I'm covering a subject. Um, I'm trained in PE and history, so if I went in and I'm told, you know, what you're doing, A level maths today. If I go into that situation and I'm taken out of my comfort zone, then I've got 20 people sitting in front of me. It's a lot more difficult than if I'm speaking to a camera where there's people all around the world who are watching. So I do find it more difficult talking and because you, you see the people in front of you, you when you're on the TV you, or behind the, the microphone for radio, you don't, you don't see the people. So there could be millions of people who are listening to it or who are watching it uh, in airports, hotels, different countries around the world. And you just don't bother about it because you can't see people. But if, yeah. you, were, if you were sitting there and you were broadcasting to 2,000 people in front of you, it becomes a bit more different because that um, physical aspect comes into it and the fact that you can see people makes it a bit more difficult because you see people looking at you and thinking, oh, geez, I wonder what they're thinking about this. So the, t- the TV and talking to a camera, that doesn't bother me. Even if, if things go wrong, if the audio cue disappears or if you're having to add a subject because you've just found out as you've gone into the studio, 
those type of things don't bother me. I'm more than happy to ad lib about things, whether it be NBA basketball, baseball, whether it be South American football, whatever it may be. I don't mind ad living about those things. It's just more difficult when you've got people uh, in, in front of you. You feel more self-conscious. I think that's a very human trait that people mm. do feel more self-conscious when they've got people in front of them than if they were talking to a microphone or talking to a TV camera. So, yeah, from that perspective, it's it, it doesn't really bother me. I, I get nerves every now and then, which I think is a good thing to have nerves because it's to have butterflies about certain uh, things that you're doing, whether you're out on a, on a live. I remember when I did the Baseball World Series a couple of years ago over in the States, um, it was different for me because when you're there, you have like the whole area around the outside. Is you've got crews of people from different places all over the world and all you see on the TV is you. But if you look to your left or your right, you've got people 40, 50, 60 metres along on both sides of you and you have to get there to get yourself a good spot early on. But that's more di- that's that's more difficult again because you're you're in a situation where it's live and you're taken out of your comfort zone because you're in another country as well, doing a sport yeah. which um, which which might be a little bit different to what you're not used to doing normally. So those type of things can make it a bit difficult. But that's to me that's part of the thrill of what and enjoyment of doing the job. Yeah, I suppose the the nerves and the adrenaline that 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 sort of small percentage of you that is sometimes a little nervous it keeps it exciting, keeps the adrenaline flowing a little bit. Um, before we uh, move on to your movie of choice, which we're here to talk about today, um, I read that you just covered the Paralympics in Tokyo as well. Uh, you, you've not long back actually. I mean, was that about was it a couple of months ago now that, that you did that? Yeah, that was back in uh, in, in September. So I did the Paralympics uh, in Tokyo for a company called OBS, which is the, the host broadcast company, Olympic Broadcast Services, who provide for the Olympics and for the Paralympics as well. So you know, that was that was brilliant. I did wheelchair rugby for for a couple of days, um, and I did the uh, the athletics, the para athletics as well. So it was ten days of that, and it was yeah, they were long days because you were up at seven and you were leaving at seven in the morning. And you were getting back at midnight and you were doing it constantly for a couple of weeks. So it was really difficult, but it was it was very enjoyable because I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky. I've been to Japan um, a couple of times before. I was there only two years previous for the Rugby World Cup and I got to see a load of the country before, uh, obviously, the pandemic. So there was no problems. In, in, in I went to the north of the country. I was in the south of the country. I was in the middle of the country. I was, I was pretty much everywhere in different places. So t- Tokyo was a bit different this time because you couldn't really do anything. You were just traveling to the venue. You were spending your day at the venue. You were working. You were going back. You'd go to bed and you were wearing a mask everywhere you went. The only time you didn't have to wear one was when you were eating or drinking or when you were in your hotel room. So, so yeah. they were doing the right thing. They were being very strict about that. Co- completely. The, 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 mm. the way things worked and for people who are living there, themselves if you walk around central tokyo if you're in the main street you have to wear a mask outside you, you had to wear a mask whether you were inside or outside it made no difference so it's a little bit different to what we've sort of seen over over this side of the world in a way but that was the way it was and that was you know we signed up to it beforehand and that's what you did so you know i was there to work i wasn't there to worry about wearing masks and it was that just became part of it you just got used to it um, and it was a, it was a brilliant experience. It was the first time I've done the, the Paralympics. I've done para sport before, which is sort of one of my specialty areas where I've done world championships and European championships and the likes. But I'd never done a Paralympics, so for me that was that was brilliant. And then, luckily enough for me, next year in February I'm off to Beijing to do uh, the Winter Olympics for the same company. So, yeah, I'm very lucky in, in what I do, and I get to travel to a lot of places around the world. But many people don't get to go to. So uh, I, I do appreciate everything that I do. I do appreciate the fact that I've worked very hard to get to the position I've, I've gotten to. But you know, if you don't put the hard work into it, you don't get to go to those type of places. So these things are, are bonuses for me in, in, in what I do. And it sort of, it helps make everything worthwhile when you're sort of getting to go to these nice places and do these different things and you appreciate uh, and you learn a lot more about yourself and about life. Excellent. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Well, yeah. So thank you very much for that, Tolson. Like, it's really uh, what a fascinating career you've had. And um, I'm I'm sure you'll go on to even greater and better things. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you what you do next. Uh, As I say, I I think the uh, the sky's the limit by the sounds of it. But um, we're here to talk about your what we well i don't know should we call it your favorite film is that an accurate statement or is it it in your top three top five would you say it's in my it's in the certainly in the top five because there's a reason why i I like this this film it's more based on the actual author and, and and the books so for me not 
a movie doesn't always translate well from a book. So if someone's written a book and you read the book and you think, gee, that was really good, and then you go and watch the movie, you can be disappointed. But this book that we're going to talk about, the, the movie, is is more, it's very hard to get the movie wrong. Like yeah. <laughs> the, way, the way the book is written, and it, it's very hard to get this movie wrong. And the movie does mirror the book very well. Um, so Alexandre Dumas is the actual author of this book. It's The Count of Monte Cristo. And for me, he wrote The Three Musketeers as well. But this book about The, the, the Count of Monte Cristo and how it translates into it, the movie um, it is pretty much runs parallel with how the book goes. And it's, a, it's written so well, and it's in the Napoleonic era back in the uh, 19th century. And it's just, it's, just, it, it's just one of those type of books that really gets you going. And at the end of it, you're sort of cheering for the main character. And when things unfold at the end of it, you're thinking that was absolutely brilliant. And the book is really thick. But this tells the story in like an hour and 40 minutes or so and you walk away from it and you go, yeah, that was really good. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's, it's got a great pace to it. Like, uh, I, I must say, I, I hadn't seen it before. So, yeah, when uh, Tolson recommended it, I watched it this afternoon. And uh, what struck me is, like you were saying, it, it's such a, a kind of familiar story because it's been adapted and ripped off so many times. You know, I thought to myself, this is the Shawshank Redemption. This is uh, Les Mis. This is also, um, uh, what's the Great Gatsby? You know, this is like, you know, and, and I checked the dates and, and, and this was before, you know, obviously all of those were penned. Um, so in the best possible way, I felt like I'd seen it already, you know what I mean? I, but I thought, what, you know, how, you know, as he, he's written this story that has just like got so many individual fantastic stories and set pieces in it. Uh, I really loved it. Thank you very much for recommending it. No, you're, you're welcome. It's, 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 it's one of those... It's one of those movies that when you're when you're watching it through, you get into about the first ten minutes and you go, okay, what's going to happen here? And then, you know, when when you see in about twenty minutes into it, and he gets he's and he's betrayed sort of half an hour into it by his best friend, and he everything crumbles around him. He's got everything going for him. He's just become the captain of a of a ship, and when the the, the captain has died beforehand, he's been promoted above his best friend. To become uh, the captain, which starts off at a chain of events, which sees him end up in jail for a period of time, and I think it's a really interesting story as well. When when you look at it, and the fact that his his friend is always his friend's very wealthy. So Mondego's friend is a very wealthy person, comes from a wealthy family, where as Edmond Dantes doesn't come from wealth, doesn't come from a great background, and as we find out throughout it, he can't even read and write. So when he's thrown in jail. Uh, he meets a guy called uh, Faria who helps him read, write. He ends up helping him to speak Italian as well as Latin, uh, along with his French. So it's one of those movies that, that sparks your mind about education as well. So it, it shows in that front that education is possible even in the worst surroundings imaginable. So from there, and then when it moves along, and you're sort of cheering the, the main character along uh, all the way. And it's got, uh, you know, one of those endings to it that you just don't expect as well. So yeah. I was doing an English class and they didn't have anything planned for the day. So I actually went through Alexander Dumas and spoke about the author and spoke about the fact that he'd written this book. And um, we talked through that. And I mentioned the fact that he actually written the three musketeers as well, but it was funny because when I put his name up on the board um, and his name is spelled D U M A S. As I'm writing it up on the whiteboard, the first thing that I hear behind me is sniggering. And the word dumbass. <laughs> All right, but no, it's not. It's not dumbass. It's yeah. Well, I can't. I, can't, I have to tell you, that's the first thing I thought of because there's a scene in the Shawshank Redemption, you know, where they when Andy Dufresne's building the library and he goes by Alexander Dumbass, <laughs> dumbass. <laughs> you know, so that was the first thing I thought of. But uh, no, you, you mentioned before about the, the the plots and the pacing. The pacing is just fantastic. It just runs at such a pace. It's never boring. It's always exciting. Twists and turns. Um, the, uh, the, the, the line, I think one of my favorite lines and it was where Guy Pierce is very, very close to the, the, to the start where he says, you're a carpenter's son. I shouldn't be envious of you or something. And I just thought that was a wonderful line. Cause it just showed that people of a higher class, you know, especially in those days thought, you know, like that there was such a division of class. So it was like, you know, I shouldn't be envious of what you've got. And I thought that was just such a wonderful line. Well, it's brilliant, isn't it? He becomes the Count of Monte Cristo and he finds that treasure. Um, and in case anyone's listening and they don't understand why he becomes the Count of Monte Cristo, when he's in jail and he meets Abby Ferrer, who teaches him 
uh, Italian, teaches him to read and write over a period of years that he's in jail. That man used to be a priest. So and he had access to wealth beyond imagination, so much money, but he never gave up the location of where this treasure was until he was on his deathbed and about to die. And he told um, Edmond Dantes, uh, who was in jail with him, uh, who becomes the Count of Monte Cristo, he told him where it was uh, located and the island is called Monte Cristo. So he becomes the Count of Monte Cristo to change his name and returns to basically gain his vengeance in Paris. But the interesting one is when he, he buys the house off the Viscount who owns it, the massive house you see, and they just unload a, a tr- <laughs> load like a trailer load of, of coins gold coins and like it just wouldn't happen. in today obviously it'd be a it'd be a transaction through the internet wouldn't it yeah that, yeah yeah back then it's just, it's just how are you going to pay for this and it just unloads a a trailer load full of coins and, and gold bullion and everything else so <laughs> it's a really old strange scene but you just it, it shows you also about wealth and how people that when he invites all these people to his house for this um party that he's actually invited people to, to to learn about everyone and bring the people that he wants together. They're all asking each other, what do you know about this man? Who do you, how much do you know about him? And, and it's all about inside information. Nothing changes over the years and over the centuries. People want to know about people and know how they've got to where they've got to. Um, so from that point of view, nothing changes over the past two centuries when it comes to how people act and how people react transactions may be different life may be slightly different how people dress is different but at the end of it people are still the same and that's what transpires throughout this movie that things are still the same now you can transplant that for 200 years later in different characters but these type of things have still happened in life and on that storyline it's just that that type of thing happened back then was interesting because napoleon bonaparte was part of it as well and it just made for the story, even though he's hardly in it, it just it made for the story to, to how things have worked and how society works in general from the rich through to the poor as well. Absolutely. There's so many archetypal stories in here, as I said, like, um, you know, the, I couldn't help thinking of Great Gatsby and that scene where he comes in the balloon. And like you said, nobody knows who he is. They want to know the information. It was, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people owe a lot to this movie. Let's put it that way. Um my uh, next question is: I was I was very interested to know, uh, first of all, how you where, where you saw this film for the first time and how you how you originally saw it, but also your history with film in general. I mean, did you grow up? Were you a film buff when you were a kid? Did you go to the cinema a lot with your family? Can you tell me a little bit about your history with film? Yeah, th- this film I, I actually saw when it came out in the cinemas back in I think it was about two thousand and two. I was living in London at the time, and I read the book um, well beforehand. Um, and when it came out in the cinema, see, I was the type of person, um, Matt, that I'd go and sit in the cinema by myself. I, I, I didn't, I didn't mind. Um, you know, even when I was like, even when I was like my early twenties, I, 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 I'm, I was more than happy to go and watch and just watch the movies and, and watch something. I still do. That's it very healthy. I've done that a couple of times myself, and I was a bit like judgmental. I was thought it was like I shouldn't be doing this, but it turned out to be some of the best cinema experiences I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> to I'm more than happy to go and sit by myself. I, I'm, I'm the type of person who um, I'm very happy in my own company. So I don't necessarily need people around me, but like times change over the years and I've got, you know, kids as well. And I, and I take them as they get older. I take them to watch movies when they're younger. I take them to kids movies as they get older, you know, take them to James Bond movies and things like that. So it's, it's a little bit different, but this movie I watched way back in about 2002 when it came out. And, um, but generally, you know, throughout, my life growing up because I grew up in the great era of VHS uh, movies and, and, and like, like that. So there was no such thing as Blu-ray and DVD no, and, no. Netflix and, and Disney plus and everything else. You know, I mean, I was just telling a story the other day. My, my father took my elder brother and I to the empire strikes back in 1982. I think it was when we were living in Sydney. Um, wow. I, still, I, I still remember I was saying to my wife that we, we went there. I can remember as clear as day. I must've been, I was about nine years old. And they gave us these, we bought at the, 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 the food area there, we bought these plastic cups, which were, you know, they were sort of this big, quite big, really big. And um, I remember we had it for years at home. We had two or three of these cups in the kitchen. They, 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 we had them for so many years that they actually gone, they actually gone almost faded. Um, <laughs> yeah, by, in the dishwasher um, and everything, yeah. We must, have, we must have had them until I was around 18. So they must have had them yeah. like 10, 10 years or so. And these things used to always be dragged out. 
Um, and you know, I remember going with my father to the movies. I go with friends to the movies. Um, I, I used to always enjoy you know going to the cinema because of the just for me the the, the sound that comes out from the the speakers in there. And you know, you can watch. You know, you can say you can go onto Netflix and you can watch something. It's not quite the same though as when you actually go to a cinema. Um, and you you sit in there and you've got that surround sound and you've got all the noise that goes with it. It just seems to make things so much so much better and so much more enjoyable. So I've always enjoyed um, going to the theatre and the cinema and 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 enjoying those type of things, whether it be um, you know an actual movie as, as or go to the theatre and, and watch plays as well. Like I'm just as, I'm just as happy watching those type of things. But it's um, it, it's an experience I, I sort of enjoy and I try and we try and propel it onto our kids as well that it's actually more enjoyable going to a movie and, and watching a movie so we always try and take them along there um, if we can um, to watch something or they go with their friends or, or whatever it may be but yeah movies have always sort of been a part of, um, of growing up and, and, and enjoying them and, and going to watch them. I think those uh, Empire Cups will be worth something now if you'd uh, kept the hold of them. <laughs> I'll tell you. We had, we had um, somewhere at my mum's place back in Sydney, I've still got them somewhere, we had like a, oh, Darth, yeah. Vader, a Darth Vader open up with the, do you remember the plastic figurines that came, the plastic figurines that came with them? I've still got plastic figurines. Now, they're, they're out of the packaging, but there's yeah. a load of plastic figurines there that you could probably put on the internet and sell. For. Oh, you mean the original, like Boba Fett and all that, yes. the toys? Yeah, yes. yeah. Exactly, exactly, the original ones. So, you, so you'd wow. have them um, with the little lightsabers and so forth. So there's 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 all those somewhere back at my mum's house, and I, I threatened one day to put them on the internet, but whether I make <laughs> anything out of them because they've been taken out of the packet, I, I don't know. I saw that episode of uh, comic, the comic book Matt guy in uh, in The Simpsons <laughs> where he pulls something out of it. <laughs> He pulls a big thing out of the. Uh, he's going to attack someone. He takes it out of the packaging. He goes, "Oh no, the packaging <laughs> worth nothing now." <laughs> like- <laughs> It's, it's like so true. Like it's it's amazing the the, uh, the what these things can be worth. I, th- I think if you've got a Boba Fett, you know, in the original packaging, it's we're talking, you know, seventy thousand dollars or something. You know, it's like it's ridiculous. But at the end of the day, what you know, very few kids are going to keep them in the packaging. You know, I, I took mine out, you know, and played with them, and I, I collected the um, you know the spaceships, you know, like Tie Fighters and the X Wings and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, um, it, it's uh, it's amazing, really. Like you know, this stuff is so kind of in vogue now. You know, like geek culture has become the mainstream, which is just bizarre. Absolutely, um, it's it's really funny, isn't it? Because you um, and and you, you look back to you look back to those movies as well, especially the Star Wars ones. And you know, the first one I think was made in nineteen seventy seven thereabouts. That's and correct. Then, yeah, and they got Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And you think that's the end of that. And then all of a sudden they bring out another three of them in the early 2000s and then they bring out another three. Uh, now, <laughs> and, they say, and they say that's the end of it, but there's all these offshoot programs that come from these things, aren't there? So it's like the Marvel movies as well. You think the Marvel movies are finished as far as the Avengers goes and then all of a sudden you've got different movies which are coming out and which are, are being um, you know, made as well. So And there's different series which are coming out. So you know these things, it's, it's, it's quite amazing actually that people who... Um, write these type of things because I don't I don't have the head to write these type of things. But you've got to have a very um, very different way of thinking to be able to come up with these storylines to be able to to be able to move things along, but at the same time keep the basis of what those stories are all about. Yeah, so keep it canon, keep it like loyal to the original, you know, because because the fans, if you do anything that's outside of canon or doesn't make sense, you know, to the character, then people, you know, the internet goes crazy, like, you know, and you can't survive that, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm completely right. And, and people, are, you talk about being loyal there. People are very loyal to particular franchises and um, you'll have people who love the Star Wars franchises, who don't like the Marvel franchises and, um, you, all these you know, super, Superman versus Batman and all these type of things. Or are you, are you a Superman person? You're a Batman person. Mm. It's all very you know, difficult. And, and actually, funny talking about that. One of the guys in the Count of Monte Cristo, Henry Cavill, is actually is the son of Edmund Dantes. At the end of it, yeah. he obviously is he's obviously um, Superman. And his towers- I, I, I had that uh, moment or somewhere. I was like, who is, who is that guy? <laughs> you know, I was really like confused. And then I, I had to Google it, but I was like, yeah, absolutely. The, like you said before, the cast in this thing is, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It's a very good, very good cast in the, in, in the mm-hmm. movie. And um, yeah, Guy Pierce. obviously I grew up with Guy Pierce when I was younger because he was Neighbours. So what, really? Yeah. Guy Pierce was one of the originals in Neighbours with Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan. Oh. 
I didn't Pierce. know that. I, I genuinely didn't know that. Yeah. Guy Pierce was the best friend of Jason Donovan in the in Neighbours. His name is Mike. Right. Yeah. So his name is Mike, um, and he was best best friends with uh, Jason Donovan's character Scott uh, in uh, that in the in and there was saying and Kylie Minogue was Charlene. So obviously, like if you look back over the years, anyone who's particularly fond of Neighbours um, would know that Jason Donovan's character got married to Kylie. Minogue's character and then they end up she ended up leaving the, the show etc um but but a uh, guy Pierce his character Mike was one of the originals and then he went from he went from uh, working in Australia to move him to Hollywood and trying to break into the the big scene over there but he's yes he's one of the main characters in the Count of Monte Cristo but he did start off in Neighbours originally well, Mike was uh, very, very happy when you uh, mentioned that we were going to do the Count of Monte Cristo because um, one of Mike's favourite film, I think, is Memento, or it's certainly in the top three. And uh, Guy Pearce in general is a huge fan of. But um, yeah, he was he was brilliant in this. You just he has that sort of hateable face, doesn't he? So intense and like you know when he's a baddie. He can suss him out from the start. You think that there's something wrong with that guy. He just doesn't sit well with me. He's uh, now he's he's brilliant, and uh, I never knew that about Neighbours. I knew that it was uh, Kylie Minogue, and um, but uh, I never. And that's strange because Neighbours was huge over here as well. It was really yeah. really big in the UK. Uh, yeah, in the nineties, it was yeah, like a huge thing. Neighbours, Neighbours, very huge. It's always it's it's still a big puller now, but um, like I don't confess to having watched much of Neighbours or, or Home and Away over the years it was just one of those things that was there in the background and you just happened to watch every now and then but I never sort of kept up to, to date with it and I never knew what was happening but I always sort of knew who the characters were and who the main people were that are actually in it and a lot, a lot of people from those type of shows whether it be um the neighbors or home and away have, have gone on to, to do sort of big things um uh, I'm just trying to think of your, your man uh Thor Chris Hemsworth um Chris Hemsworth was in home and away Really? I didn't know that either. So he was in Home and Away. Uh, so he's obviously gone to do pretty decent things in Hollywood. Uh, so there's yeah. a, lot, a lot of actors, um, a lot of actors who have started off in either Neighbours or Home and Away who have actually progressed their career uh, really well. But I, I think I find acting, you mentioned about Guy Pearce there and about his character in The, the Count of Monte Cristo. It's very, you know, you've done well, I think, in something when people are, are trying to throw things at you and, uh, and think you're a really bad person when you're doing something in a movie. <laughs> So if your if your character is supposed to be a bad character and people are going, oh, I don't like him. No, he's not very nice. Then <laughs> you know you've done a good job because if to be a baddie, you have to be a good baddie. Um, Absolutely, he's very very hateable. <laughs> yeah. so, so to do to do that and to have people thinking, oh, Joe, I hate that guy. And then he could go out and do another movie where he's completely different, and they go, oh, I really like him. So then you, you're doing your job. And acting, people think acting is a very very easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do. And you see many people who do method acting who basically stay in character the whole time throughout the course. Yeah, you sort of Daniel day Lewis's and uh, people like that. Um, have you ever tried your hand at it, Tolson? Is it something you've ever done? No, besides besides doing The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe when I was in about uh, fourth class at school, I'd say probably not. Um, that counts. I, that counts, definitely. <laughs> I've, I've, never, I've, never aspired to, I've never aspired to get into to, to acting. I, I think... Like it's a, it's a really funny one because you can be talking to someone and, and you know having a chat with someone like we are now and you you you're basically doing exactly what they do in a movie but all of a sudden when you're doing it in a movie you've got to actually think to make sure that you do everything that's asked of you by a director or a producer and whereas in everyday life you're you, you could be acting where you're trying to prevent someone from knowing about a Christmas present and yeah. try to do it in the nicest possible way. But you're acting yeah. about something. Oh, I've got to go to so and so's house because I've got to see them about this. And you're sort of telling a fib, but you're acting at the same time. And but it's a bit different to actually when you have cameras in front of you and lights on you, and you happen to portray a character which you've never known about until a couple of months beforehand. You've got to change things, and that's why you get the likes of the Daniel Day Lewis you mentioned there, who stay in character because they struggle to come out of that character. And even you see stories of people who, after they've done movies, and they do that type of stuff, it's hard for them to actually get back to being into normal life because they're so used to being, like, let's take him, for example, in the Gangs of New York and Daniel Day-Lewis in that, with his quasi New York Irish accent in it, and he's, you know, quite a bad person in it, um, and he's done bad things throughout it, and he's got to be that really dark character, and then he has to go back to being normal in life, and then he does different movies where he's a completely different character, 
So the, the mental toll it must take on people, and I can see why the likes of he retire early and say that they're not doing any more movies because mentally it must be quite exhausting um, doing it. So I, I think people, they, they enjoy doing those type of things. And I think, I think with any career, there's a certain shelf life in a way before you have to move to something else. So you, I'd find it very difficult if I did the same career from when I was 18 years of age to when I retired to say 65 or whatever it may be. Like people did that in the past, but mm. yeah, getting away from, from talking about acting, but in life in general, that people generally need challenges. I, I do. If, if I don't find challenges in life, whether it be a, a sporting challenge or whether it be a challenge in my career or whether it be a challenge I'm trying to you know, impress on my kids to do things, then I don't feel comfortable. I, I have to have, you know, an idea of something I'm sort of looking towards. And I'm sort of a, 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 I'm not, my wife will tell you, sometimes I'm not a very nice person because I'm sort of focused on, on doing things. Um, You're driven. You sort of have to have a bit of that about you at times. And I, I, I'm much, much less so now than when I actually played sport. When I played sport, um, it, it was, you know, girlfriends out at the time, everything was sort of focused on me. It was always yeah. me. me. Um, and it, it, because it was all about sport, and it was all about what you were going to do. And you look back on it now and you think, gee, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that nice. So mm. I try and impress on my children now that you've got to be polite to people and you've got to be nice to people. You can't treat them in, in, in the type of way that perhaps maybe I treated people over the years and, and things. You well, you live and learn, don't you? And, and I think that the, I got the feeling about life is when we get to our 90s, touch wood, and we're sat there, I think that's when you will have just about mastered it. Do you know what I mean? Like that's the problem, you know, I think that it takes, you have to live and learn. That's the problem, isn't it? You can't, very few people are born with that sort of maturity, I think. Yeah, you know, uh, and, uh, I've, read, I've read something recently about uh, males don't mature until they're 25. And, you know, I, 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 I sort of, I can, I can agree with that because I, I, was I, like, I would raise that a little bit. I'd probably put that to about 28, 29, <laughs> so not maybe a bit more. But yeah, yeah. Probably, probably true. Like I was, I was, I was yeah. very lucky that I got to travel and move overseas when I was like 22, 23 years of age um, to play sport. So, you know, I'm very lucky with a lot of things I've done. But, yeah, like I, I'm... I've made loads of mistakes in my life. I, I tell these kids when I'm at school every day teaching, I, I go like, it's okay to make a mistake because I made them every single day. It's mm -hmm. it's whether you make the same mistake over and over again or whether you realise you're making a mistake and you change the way you do things that make you into a better person. So yeah. everyone makes mistakes. It's, it's to how you deal with making mistakes. And there's no harm in making mistakes because we're not perfect. Nobody is, no. and anyone who tells you they're perfect and know exactly what they're doing are telling an absolute fit. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's there has not, to be value to change. There has to be value to it. Completely. Like I, I go into my job and people go, oh, that was great, that was brilliant, everything else. I go, but yeah, but I didn't do that right. They go, yeah, it was fine. But so uh, I'm always trying to improve on, on, on things I do and, and try and make things better. And everyone should be the same, no matter what walk of life you're in. Um, you know, and, and if, it doesn't matter if you're a, you're a house husband, housewife, you work, whatever it may be, whether you're in sport, whether you're in film, TV, always try and improve yourself and, and what you do each day, whether it's one small thing you do, just try and make yourself into a, into a better person. And it gives you a bit of a goal to work towards as well. Because if you just sit there back and think, yeah, well, that was easy, I'll, I'll, I'll crack on and keep doing the same thing over and over again, you lose a bit of focus in your life as well. So that's why I always try and find I need to have something to sort of aspire to and look ahead towards is it helps me um, as a person try and improve the way I am. It doesn't always work out. Um, you know, it doesn't always work out the way I want it to work out. But if I don't try, then what's the point? And I always say, if you, if you try and it doesn't work, then at least you know it hasn't worked. But there's no point sitting back and going, do you know what? I wish I had done that. I, I don't want to ever have regrets in saying I wish I'd done something because that to yeah. me is the ultimate failure. Absolutely, it's true. It's, it's tried and tested, and it's and, and it's great hearing it from you as well. Actually, someone who of, of your stature and your experience, uh, what you've done to you know, it's very it's very humbling, and but it's it's very useful as well for people. I think you know, because uh, hearing people talk the way you do and and how humble you are about your career and your choices, it makes it. I think it makes people who are um, confused or people who are maybe debating what to do. It just gives them a bit more hope. Do you know what I mean? Because I think that, you know, I've been in that position where I've been terrified of failure, you know, and I just, and I've got to that point in my life now where I, I just don't care anymore. Do you know what I mean? About what people think. 
And um, I heard one recently, you might, you might think this is a little bit harsh, but it's really helped me, which is people are going to make fun of you whether you do stuff or you don't. Do you know what I mean? And, I, you know, I know it sounds a little bit, but it's true. You know what I mean? People are going to have their judgments and whatever. And so you might as well do something you love, you know? Absolutely. I'll, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you an example of, uh, of how, how you get hardened up as well. Is that if you just take a look at my name, anyone who's listening to this, um, people don't know whether my first name is my last name, my last name is my first name. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and then they make a joke out of it anyway. And I go, mm. and I always say to people, go, like, you can say what you want. I've heard everything you want to say. So that makes <laughs> yeah. Um, so for me, for me, my mother used to always enjoy my name because when she needed to find me in a crowd, she would always ask for me and then they go, oh, yeah, he's over there. Because yeah. it, wasn't like, it wasn't like the same name as everyone else. So I, I, had, Absolutely, something, yeah. I had something which sort of stood me apart and was different. Um, so, so for me, it was always, um, it was always, you know, I grew up with that name. I, there, was, there was even actually one point when I was younger that I used to get so annoyed by people um, teasing me and saying stuff that I actually wanted to change my name. I actually said to my really? brother, I want to change my name because I was so annoyed with it. I must have been about 10 or 11 years of age. And I was so annoyed. And she explained the story to me about you know how I got my name and um you know and, and about how can, can you share it. that with us now? I'd love to hear yeah, that. It was, please. It was, so my, my last name is actually French going back um generations. So um, but my first name, I've got two two brothers, Darren and Kevin, and I've mm. got a sister, uh, Andrea. So, so they weren't messing around there, were they? No, so, <laughs> so like, I'm the I'm the second eldest. So when we grew up in um there's a place called Bex Hill on the south coast so just down the road from Hastings and St Leonard's so when I grew up there was a kid in the street who had the name Tolson and Mm -hmm. my mother and father liked it and that's how the name came to me now there are a few more of me around the world now um from one of my sister's friends had a child ages back and uh, that was what was the first name, and I got another friend whose son's middle name is is Tolson as well. So there's a yeah. there's a few of them around, but the the two names together, I, I I'm I'm very confident that I could put a lot of money on the fact that no one would have the same first and last name put together as I do um, in the world. So I'm I don't think there's another one of me in the world with the first and last name exactly the same. So my my name itself basically came from those origins. It's Scandinavian. Uh, because I had a neighbour in London who was uh, Danish, uh, and he'd heard my name before, maybe in a different spelling and and so forth than what it is. But my name is basically Scandinavian, so it's a, it's funny because I have a Scandinavian first name, a French second name. I was born in England and raised in Australia, and now live in Ireland. So, I'm sort of, <laughs> so, so I'm between. So it's and now I'm always back in the UK, obviously, to do work at the BBC. So I'm sort of I've got a strange old outlook on life is that I'm a bit of a bits of, uh, bits of this and, and bits of that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So for me, it's actually, but it's been really helpful because I've been lucky enough to go to so many different places and see so many different cultures and be amongst things that I can actually take a bit out of it as I go along and just yeah. understand that things are very different everywhere you go. And I, I, I just go back to when I was, when I first came to the UK, after a year of being over, I went back and I went out to a place, um, a, a bar just near where I lived when I was um, when I got back there. And some people I hadn't seen for like, for, the, for a year. And I saw one guy and got talking to him. He goes, I haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. <laughs> I was thinking, and I, you know, that type of thing I, made me all of a sudden think, people don't change. They just keep on doing the same thing over and over again. So yeah. they think, it just weeks go into months, months go into years, and they don't think about much because they're doing the same thing week in, week out. And it's, so it's things like that which sort of lead me to think that I need to do different stuff all the time because you've got to get the most out of what you're actually doing. Um, and I still remember that. I, I mean, just remember the look on uh, the look on their face. Oh, I haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I said, yeah. I it says it all, doesn't it? Really, like yeah. I think so, I think I think so, someone like yourself has got a healthy curiosity about cultures about life in general and, and not everyone has that you know some people are really isolated and kind of fear change and you don't want to do this don't want to do that but I think that growing up so multinational like like you did uh you know it that's the ultimate way to sort of battle xenophobia isn't it because if you're 
if you are of different nationalities and you travel and you, you know, live with people of different cultures, that's where the fear just dissipates because it's always the people who haven't left like the little town in the center of England that are so scared of foreigners, you know, <laughs> it's because they don't know any, you know, it's like that kind of thing, you know. So It's, it's, it's so true. When I, when I played in London, uh, rugby league this is, that, that it was very difficult to get guys to move down from the north. So mm. to try and get people to come from Manchester, say, two and a half hours, down to London, they didn't want to move away from their family. And, and it's really funny because in Australia, people would quite happily go from one side of the country to the other, which is a four hour plane trip. Um, yeah. And they'd be more than happy to move from Sydney to Perth and go and start a, a new job over there or play sport over there. And there'd be no thought about the fact that, well, I'm not going to be right near my family. You mm. just, you, that, that's the way that people uh, sort of wired over there. And it's very different over here where there's a very, uh, the culture of staying close to your family and, not moving too far away so which is which is completely understandable it's just a different way of looking at life but eventually people break out of that and they understand they go oh gee i wish i'd done this a long time ago because yeah you get to learn and, and see a lot more about culture about life about different personalities and different nationalities and it's it's one of those things that you if you ever get the opportunity to do anything i fully recommend to try and take it and don't think too much about it because you'd be wishing in years to come that you've done it at least if you do it and it doesn't work out, you can say, well, I tried that and it didn't work out. Well, Tolson, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to, to me. I, I just, um, if I could just get sentimental for a moment, having someone in your position come and talk to us on the show is just so encouraging. And to you talking about your career and your life so humbly. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm getting becoming a sentimental old man as I get into my 30s. But I just want to say again, that just thank you so much for this. And it, it really is encouraging for people just starting in, in the sort of media world like we're trying to do. So, so yeah, thank you very, very much for your time. We really appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, you're more than welcome to have me back any time and uh, to talk about anything else, more than happy. We'll take you up on that because uh, we did talk about possibly doing the Dark Knight trilogy, so uh, we might have you back for that if that would be all right. That'd be, that'd be perfect. Brilliant, mate. Well, thank you very much, Tulsa, and uh, thanks again. No problem. Yeah, how about that, eh? Did you enjoy that, Michael? What a thoroughly lovely person Tolson is. He sounds like he's an absolutely gent of a man. And uh, right, yeah, the conversation is. the conversation got deeper than I thought it would. Yeah, no, we went uh, we went a bit deep there. It was it was just um, it was great to hear about his life and his career. And um, and again, just yeah, what a nice guy to give us the time. And yeah. he said that he would um, be more than willing to come back on the show if we wanted him to come back and talk about the Dark Knight trilogy. That's awesome. He could teach me more about the history of Neighbours and Home and Away. I want to hear about all the other famous people there. But <laughs> Holly that Valance, amazing, he didn't even it? touch upon. Holly Valance. <laughs> but no, I, I had no idea about that, yeah. But fast, yeah, and, fascinating. And incredibly young Henry Cavill as well. It was great to see the origins of Superman in, in that. I, we didn't even talk about that before. No, I, I, it was one of those moments where I was looking at him and I was like, holy shit, it's <laughs> Superman. No way. I don't recognise you without some really fake upper lip. That's weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's all from Matt and myself today. And a very big thank you again to Tolson for taking the time out to speak to us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to like this video as it really helps with the YouTube algorithm. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch by searching for the name Matt and Mike Pull Focus. Say goodbye, Matt. Bye, Matt. Say goodbye, Tolson. Oh, yeah, you can't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>